This is Twit. I wanted to ask you one of the interesting things about the pandemic, as we're hopefully on the tail end of it here uh, over the next uh, you know three to six months. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, I know that I know that there's been like an increase in uh, 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 a need for like things that you wouldn't expect, like COBOL programmers, right, are in high demand right now. Because <laughs> a lot who, who of these old who systems. Who would have thought like 18 months ago we'd be talking about COBOL, right? Exactly, exactly. But I'm kind of <laughs> curious from both the mainframe standpoint and just from the Linux Foundation standpoint, like how has the pandemic affected what you guys do? Not in terms of how you operate, but are you having to help these? Uh, projects in different ways because of the effects of the pandemic. Oh, absolutely. And I think we've seen all sorts of new and interesting things come from it. I mean, we've seen um, the launch of a, a public health foundation within the Linux Foundation, which has, you know, been focused on um, you know, the technologies around that space, not only thinking specifically about COVID-19, but also um, what comes after that. Um, you know, we have seen uh, folks really uh, moving more towards a lot of online and digital learning because they're just, you can't go to conferences right now. So this is the only way you can learn. And um, our events team, um, you know, in the early days of the pandemic spent six weeks and researched all of the platforms out there um, and spent a lot of time figuring out these communities, they want to get together. They want to engage with one another. They can't do it in person. And it's really frustrating. But what is a way that we can emulate that as strong as possible? And they've they've really tried to lead the way in, in figuring out ways to do that in a very um, professional way, but also in a way that's really engaging um, a lot of folks. And, and a lot of those um, pieces of, you know, transform over time. And I think another thing that we've started to see is, and I think it's great that you mentioned the COBOL bit there, because I think we're right about a year um, at least I think just almost right about a year ago is when you started to see some um, particular state governors throwing their hands up in the air and saying, oh, this COBOL, we can't do anything about it. It's making all of our employment systems run slow, yada, 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 yada. Um, as it turns out, I don't think the COBOL was really the problem, but that's, I guess, beside the point. Um, but what we have seen is um, different parts of our society have been taxed in different ways that we have never expected or encountered ever before. And um, I think uh, unemployment in those systems, which many of them are built upon decades and decades of, um, you know, code, a lot of those on on technologies that, um, you know, maybe aren't the newest and shiniest. There's probably not a whole lot of unemployment systems that are written in Rust, um, for example. You never know. There probably is one. Somebody in the chat will find it. Um, but, you know, there has been a need that we have seen arise to help step in there and help make a difference and help bring those things forward. Um, one of my proudest moments in working here was um, with the Open Mainframe Project within a week of really COBOL, the need for COBOL programmers um, hitting the mainstream and, and hitting the, you know, the six o'clock news. Um, we had launched uh, initiatives of COBOL training materials, which are all available under Creative Commons licenses, so anybody can use them. They're not COBOL training materials where you need a 3270 terminal. They're COBOL training materials that you can use VS Code um, you know, with. Uh, we launched a forum so that if you are a COBOL programmer and you're available for work or donation or volunteer time, um, that you could announce your availability. And we have... Um, I think within a week or so, we had like over a thousand people that raised their hand to say, hey, I'm a COBOL programmer. I'm I'm here to help. Like if you need COBOL resources, I'm here. Um, and furthermore, then we've also started to see uh, a language like COBOL um, start to look towards, and I hate to always say modern because it makes COBOL seem old because it's, it's really um, a technology still being taught. It um, has a lot of legacy built behind it. But, you know, you where you would normally see certain tooling available for a language like unit testing, like debugging, um, you know, like different sorts of frameworks available, COBOL didn't have a lot of that out there. Um, and a lot of it really came from its legacy is, um, you know, I grew up a computer science grad. Most people who were computer science grads were not taught COBOL. If you were in the business administration or the business science um, schools, you were taught COBOL. Um, it's the same way as math majors were probably taught a lot of uh, MATLAB and things like that, where 
um, you know, computer science major may not be an ex or are, for example, where a computer science major wouldn't have been exposed to that. So with that, you see you've seen a lot of disconnects between COBOL evolving as a language and the common tooling around that. And one of the projects that we just launched, um, which is called COBOL Check, is a unit testing framework for COBOL so that you can do test driven development in COBOL, which is an absolutely fantastic idea. Anybody who's been doing programming for the last 20 years is going to look at it and says, OK, it's about darn time. But the point is, is we're starting to see many of these organizations where the and, and even government agencies where the trend might have been of how do we take this old COBOL stuff and rewrite it in something else? You're not seeing that really actively being as pursued. Now you're seeing is how do I invest more into this? Because there's a ton of value here. It's really hard for me to recreate. Um, but if I have tooling and everything that is helping accelerate and helping make the quality of that code better, let's invest that way because um, I don't want to redo decades and decades of logic. So, you know, we've seen it in just so many different areas. Um, you know, we've partnered with IBM around the Call for Code initiative, and we've, you know, we've seen all sorts of interesting, um, you know, projects and coding ideas that are really helping benefit our society as a whole. Um, you know, we've seen a number of our projects launch different diversity and inclusion um, initiatives, especially with a lot of the things that, at least for uh, folks in the United States, that we have been seeing that, um, you know, within our culture. Um, and you know, I, I think you know, sometimes you know, pandemic. I think it's really been hard on all of us. Um, it's been hard on a lot of our communities. Um, you know, some of them really had a hard shift into getting into pandemic mode. But what I've always uh, seen is uh, when you see sort of these times of uh, great stress and, uh, you know, great uh, impacts like this, you also see um, a lot of great and unique positive things coming out of it. And uh, I think we have just seen a huge number of projects flowing our way and, and some in areas that I don't think we would have necessarily expected um, a couple of years ago, and, and maybe that's a little bit of pandemic. Um, maybe it's also um, just a, like a little bit of where we're at as a society right now. So, um, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, I know, I know, probably ever, and both of you and probably everybody in our communities is hoping to get back together in person soon, um, and uh, hopefully, we're getting there.